Good evening. Welcome to the 2020 Ruckman Lecture. The Jerry E. Ruckman Lecture Series is sponsored by the UNL Department of Physics and Astronomy and made possible by the generous endowment of 1962 UNL BS physics major, Jerry Ruckman. Each fall, we, nationally, we host a nationally recognized education speaker on popular science topics or physics education issues. Please note that we are in a Zoom webinar tonight, which is a little more restrictive than a Zoom meeting. We have reserved chat for solving technical issues, but questions may be submitted through the Q&A feature as they occur to you, and I will collate them for the time remaining at the end of the presentation and pitch them to the speaker. Tonight, we are pleased to welcome Gail Zasowski from the University of Utah and spokesperson for the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. The Sloan Survey Instrument is a 2.5 meter wide angle telescope that has been surveying the night sky for the last 20 years. And tonight, Gail will share some key insights that Sloan has provided into the nature of our universe. Please send a warm telepathic welcome to Gail Zasowski. Thanks, Kevin, and thanks to the Department of Physics and Astronomy for, uh, for inviting me out. This is, this is exciting. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk tonight about astronomical data, uh, what kinds of data astronomers use, the way that the data that we use have changed, has changed over the centuries, how we use the data to explore the universe, and of course, why we need so very dang much of it. Um, since I always get asked this question, I'll just start this off. This is not me in this picture, unfortunately. Uh, this is a, a stock photo that I found, but I have been here. This is the Delicate Arch uh, down in Arches National Park, a couple hours away here from Salt Lake City. Uh, in the background here, we see the night sky dominated by our Milky Way, uh, in this case, the very center of the Milky Way galaxy. Advance, okay. So we'll start appropriately enough with the night sky. So this is the dark-ish sky that most of us see if we live in a city or in the suburbs, a place that has streetlights and things like that. Now, the average person can see about a few hundred stars under these conditions. And of course, I guess that, that, that number drops substantially if there are more and more lights. But for most of human history, we didn't have streetlights. We didn't have uh, the amount of um, light pollution that we have now. And the night sky looked something more like this, which we can now only really see by going to a dark site very far away from cities and from highways. Under these conditions, the average person can see about 10,000 stars when the sky is this dark, although of course only about 5,000 at any uh, given moment because the earth is famously opaque. Uh, humans have been observing the night sky and using it uh, throughout all of recorded history and presumably much earlier than that to know when to plant crops, to be able to predict uh, eclipses and so on. One of the first, if not the first, comprehensive Western catalogs of star positions was made by a guy named Hipparchus back in the second century BC. Uh, Hipparchus was a Greek astronomer and mathematician who built on the methods of earlier astronomers in the Middle East and elsewhere to compile a long list of stellar positions and relative brightnesses. Um, it was fairly simple uh, and it was modified and was expanded by others over the centuries, but always with the fundamental limitation of what the human eye can actually see. That all changed in the 17th century when Hans Lippershe and Galileo and Newton and others developed the telescope. So with a small telescope or even really good binoculars nowadays, the number of stars we can actually see in the night sky shoots up from 10,000 to about 300,000 spread across the sky. And that idea that there were many more things out there than what we could see with our eyes, many, many more things than what we could see with our eyes and the ability to see them brighter and bigger opened up whole new avenues of research, whole new ways uh, to, analyze, um, to analyze the sky. Uh, William and Caroline Herschel are a good example of this. So uh, William and Caroline were a brother and sister team from Germany who worked in England. They used several home-built telescopes to discover and study tons of things, uh, including comets and galaxies and the planet Uranus. Uh, they also used the much larger st stellar catalogs available by this time, supplemented by telescopic observations, to estimate the shape of the Milky Way galaxy. And that's this map um, there at the top in the upper left. Uh, there's a few things about it that they got right, uh, many things that they got wrong. Uh, but I really like showing this because I think it's a really impressive feat for having done so early on uh, in our scientific exploration of our place in the universe. Tell in addition to stars, telescopes also made galaxies more visible, or I guess we should call them spiral nebulae, uh, as they were called at the time. But early studies of these objects relied on astronomers making drawings of what they could see through the telescope, interpreting what their eyes told them into the kinds of materials that other people could look at later. 
Uh, one famous example, uh, the Earl of Ross in Ireland made several of these drawings, uh, including this gorgeous picture of M51 or the Whirlpool Nebula. So this is his drawing uh, from 1845 and you can compare it to a, a, a modern day image of the same galaxy taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. So a few decades later though, as telescopes got bigger and bigger and technology improved, we were able to move beyond lists and drawings to actually record data in some permanent way so that other people could analyze the same data independently. Uh, and this used at first uh, photographic film technology attached to increasingly large telescopes. So in the upper right here, this is the 100 inch telescope at Mount Wilson Observatory outside of Los Angeles. And this is actually the main telescope that was used to discover the expansion of the universe in the early 1900s, arguably one of the most important discoveries in, in all of science. Uh, this was led by Edwin Hubble, who used data collected by other people from a few dozen galaxies to show that the farther away a galaxy is, and that's what's here on the bottom here, so the farther away a galaxy is up here, the faster we see it moving away from us. So I'll talk in a little bit about how we actually measure that, but I just want to emphasize the sample size here, 32 galaxies underpins one of the most fundamental discoveries um, of our time. And now, 90 years later, we have a much wider range of telescope technology to work with. So here are some examples um, from different places in the world and in space. We have, we have bigger telescopes. We have telescopes that are networked together across the entire planet. We've got telescopes in space. We have telescopes that can see radio waves and x-rays and gamma rays, telescopes that don't look like what we think of as telescopes. Um, and what this means is that we can observe large numbers of objects and a wide range of different kinds of information uh, about those objects. So this is an example. Uh, I don't usually show graphs in public talks, but I think this is a savvy audience. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and risk it. Uh, so this graph shows the number of stars that we've observed as part of different projects. So number of stars along here uh, as a function of time along this axis here. So these stars at the top, this, this pattern up here uh, are those that we've uh, taken pictures of. And the stars here in this lower part are those that we've taken spectra of, which I'll describe in a little bit, which is uh, uh, a way that we uh, um, learn more information about the objects. So basically the, the takeaway from this is that prior to the 1970s or so, samples of thousands of objects were common, but nowadays hundreds of thousands, millions, tens of billions, even billions, uh, sorry, tens of millions up to billions of objects are increasingly common. And if you look at the pattern of how the number of stars that we've observed increases over time, we see that it roughly follows Moore's law, which just describes the increase in computing power over time. Um, so basically we're moving beyond just counting how many objects you see in a patch of sky to moving into an era of being able to gather details about as many of those objects as possible. And I like to think of it as the evolution from like an early census where you would record how many people lived in a house to nowadays where the powers that be also know about the Netflix browsing history of everyone in that house and the grocery store shopping habits of everyone in that household. Um, and for better or for worse, that more complex data paints a much fuller picture of what life in that house looks like. And that kind of complexity is what we're actually trying to measure uh, in astronomy uh, now as well with these, with these very big data sets. The tricky thing then is we have to then tie all that data together in order to understand how the universe works. So from the cosmic microwave background or this, this leftover glow from the Big Bang that pervades the entire universe to galaxies down to individual stars and planets, all of these obey the same laws of physics. So gravity, electricity, magnetism, and all the other fundamental forces. Computer simulations are one of the best ways to explore how different physics, how different physical theories affect the universe's evolution on different scales. But in order to build and to test and to validate these theories, these simulations, we need big sets of data that sample the real universe on all of these different scales. Um, and they span a huge range. So 1.2 billion light years across is the typical simulation size. And we're thinking about like the large scale distribution of matter in the universe, millions of light years for a galaxy system down to a light month for, you know, pairs of stars down to light hours or light minutes if we're talking about the scales of individual or solar systems. So let's, let, let's look now at, at some of these simulations for different size scales in the universe. So starting here on the largest scale, maybe, there we go. So this is a cosmo what astronomers call a cosmological simulation. So this is looking at how dark matter, how the mass in the universe responds to gravity over uh, many billions of years. And we see it starts out fairly smooth and homogeneous. And then as time passes, clumps together and to form these very dense 
relatively dense clumps of matter, which are shown in the pink and the white, and then these very large, relatively empty voids of space here shown in the blue. And if we zoom in on one of these clumps, we can look at not only where the mass is, but also what's happening with, uh, with the non-dark matter, with the gas and the, and, and the stars and the dust that are in these systems. So this is now zooming in on one of those small clumps from the earlier movie. Uh, and in the upper left, this is the starlight. So this is what we would see by eye if we could see um, these galaxies. This is the density of the gas. And you can already see that there's some structures uh, stretching between the clumps of matter that aren't visible to our eyes. The lower left here shows the temperature of this gas. And the lower right here shows the fraction of the gas that's in heavy elements, so things that are heavier than, than hydrogen and helium. And so if we play the movie forward, see if this one works. Okay, I have to click on that screen, got it. Uh, so as, as, as we go through several billion years of the universe's evolution, we can see all of these different properties evolve and interact with each other. So we can see in the lower left, you see the big shock waves from supernovae going off, these explosions of massive stars and outbursts from the supermassive black holes, the center of galaxies. You can see how that has an impact on the fraction of heavy elements in the galaxies there in the lower right-hand panel. Um, so all of these very complicated physics are happening uh, over fairly long periods of time and altering the gas and the stars that form out of that gas in, in subtle and, and not so subtle ways. We can zoom in even further to a solar system being born. So this, this is simulation is gonna do some rotating, it's gonna do some zooming, and then it'll start running forward in time where here the color is, is showing its density of the gas. Um, so what we're looking at here is a couple of protostars being born uh, and a couple of protostellar systems, um, protoplanetary systems really, uh, early solar systems, uh, colliding, merging, flinging off gas in all directions, planets forming in disks around the stars. Uh, the bright white dots that you see moving out are called brown dwarf stars, which are sort of a, uh, intermediate between giant planets and stars, not quite hot enough to generate uh, energy on their own like stars do. So even at these relatively small scales and short time scales, tens of millions of years, the simulations tell us that there's a lot of complex physics happening, in this case, uh, rel relatively quickly. And so the sizes that you need to study all of these different environments vary by a factor of more than 10 billion. Now, no computer simulation is going to be able to do any of this at once, and no, and, and there's very few observational frameworks, a like collection of data sets that are going to be able to sample everything all at the same time. You need an enormous amount of data if you want to explore one of these size regimes, say, let alone all three. Uh, so the question was, in the early 90s, is can we actually build an experiment uh, that does tackle all of these questions at once? And this was the motivation for the project that uh, came to be called the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Um, and this was really novel at the time. So this is the early 1990s. Going out to collect vast amounts of data without a clear limiting goal in mind wasn't really the way that most people were thinking about data collection. Like you had an object, I think this galaxy is super interesting. Can I please have some telescope time to go take this data to answer this question? Um, but the idea of, well, let's just get all the data we can. Let's take uh, images as cross as, as much of the sky as we can. Let's observe as many galaxies as we can, and we'll see what we find. Uh, which isn't a super easy sell to funding agencies, it turned out. Um, but the amount of stuff or the amount of science that you can do with such a vast, tr undesigned trove of data, and I don't mean that in a negative way, I mean it's not biased by what you think you're going to do with the data, but a vast trove of data that is just trying to sample the universe at the, as the universe is exists. Um, this approach actually turned into be one of the major drivers today, both for SDSS and for other large astronomical projects, um, which is pretty remarkable. So the numbers of types of objects uh, quoted here and, uh, and where they are in the sky uh, is all from the earliest generation of SDSS. So the phase that actually ended about 15 years ago. I should say the orange sort of spider looking things here are maps of the, of the, uh, the positions of the uh, supermassive black holes and galaxies if you're looking out of the Milky Way plane and then below the Milky Way plane. So away from all of our own galaxy. Okay, so how did the data get collected? What do they look like? What are we actually measuring here? So for how did the data get collected, I uh, have to give a shout out to the enormous network of hardware and software and humanware that makes all of this possible. So SDSS actually has two dedicated telescopes um, to this, one at uh, uh, the Apache Point Observatory down in New Mexico here in the US, and one at Las Campanas Observatory outside of La Serena in uh, northern-ish Chile. So both of these telescopes have mirrors that are about seven and a half feet across, just for sense of scale. 
Uh, these feed the starlight into some of the instruments that I'll, that I'll show in a minute. But the other essentially critical component of this project are the hundreds of people at dozens of institutions around the planet. So here's a picture of several dozen of us at our annual team meeting uh, in Chile a couple years ago. Uh, for the kind of work that's being done here, it's actually a pretty small team that's building the instruments, writing the software to control the instruments, writing the code, to analyze the data, and packaging everything up uh, to release out to the world. Um, those of you who are attending the educators workshop this weekend will, get, will uh, get to hear Britt Lundgren talk a bit more about that public data and how it's being used by astronomers around the world, as well as by schools and, uh, and non-astronomers and educators all around the globe, which is, which is really exciting. Okay, so when astronomers say imaging, and I've used that word a couple of times, we just mean taking pictures of the sky. So uh, SDSS took images of a large fraction of the sky, like I said, mostly away from where the Milky Way is. Uh, it took these pictures at five different wavelengths or five different energies of light, which I guess we can call color, five different colors of light. And this lets us measure the brightnesses and the colors of stars and galaxies. Uh, one thing to remember, all astronomical images are black and white when they come off the telescope. Um, usually there's a filter put in front of the camera that limits what light is able to enter the camera, but then it's, uh, but it's, it's, it's really only after the fact when the pictures from the different colors of light are then false colored and stacked together to make all those gorgeous multicolor space images uh, that we all love. And so for the SDSS, all this imaging was done using five uh, colors of light. Uh, the picture in the bottom left there gives you a sense of the size of the camera. Uh, this whole thing is um, holding the camera uh, and, and the, the detectors in it. Um, and this particular camera is actually at the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum in DC right now. Okay, so you take your pictures and you have all your brightnesses and your colors of your sources. And this gives you some idea of which dots in the sky are stars, which dots are galaxies, which dots are supermassive black holes. But if we wanna learn more, we need to take spectra, which means collecting the light again, but instead of splitting it up into two colors or five colors, we divide it into thousands of colors, into thousands of wavelengths. And so we pick out which objects we want to look at. Um, and then we collect the light. And you can think of it as taking a light from an object, let's say a galaxy, and splitting it up into a rainbow, which I'm going to call a spectrum. And then we look at how bright the galaxy is in these very fine color bins. So you can think of the x-axis here as color. So this is the wavelength of light that our eyes perceive as red. This is the wavelength of light here on the left that our eyes perceive as blue. And then um, the, the spikes here show you where the galaxy is very bright in these very, very, very narrow ranges of color. And so the patterns that we see here, we can compare to physical models. And this tells us things like what elements the galaxy is made out of. So as an example, some of these lines here are coming from things like hydrogen or silicon. Uh, some of the dips here are coming from things like magnesium. And so it can tell you things about what elements are in the galaxy, it can tell you how hot or how dense the gas is, and it can tell you how quickly the galaxy is moving towards you or away from you. Um, the equipment to do this isn't really that different from a camera, uh, but of course it's a really big camera plus a couple extra components uh, to do that very fine splitting up into colors. So this is a picture of the interior of one of the, one of the instruments, we call it a spectrograph because it takes spectra um, that's used for, for the current generation of SDSS. And I didn't put a size scale on here, but that entire big metal framework is about seven feet long. So this is, a, this is a very big, very, very heavy uh, instrument. OK, so in SDSS, we get the light from the sky into the instruments using these metal plates. So these plates, I actually have one here with me. Oh, these plates are big, aluminum. They're heavy. Uh, they're solid. Every single hole on the plate, you can see it here or in the video, uh, corresponds to a position on the sky of a star or a galaxy or a supermassive black hole that we want to look at. And so uh, a fiber optic cable is hand plugged into every single one of those holes. That was a video that just played at the top. Um, and then it's directed into the instruments uh, in order to record the spectra. That whole plate is, a, is itself is then flipped over and plugged into the back end of the telescope, which is what the video on the bottom here is showing. So this is one of our telescope operators. Um, and she's loading up uh, the plate that's been fully plugged, going to look at something in the night sky. She goes and she opens up the building that has the telescope in it. This is the base of the telescope. Points it up into position and then uses the cart uh, to load to uh, remove the plate from last night that we observed, plug the new one in. She goes and stores uh, stores the old plate, a old plate, away plate, away right away, away right away. Takes a bow, 
move the whole building off of the telescope. That's easier than moving the telescope itself. And you can see the operators there uh, as, as nightfall comes, um, getting everything set up, getting the calibrations taken and everything and getting ready for a night full of observing. So that's how the data get taken and the data get routed uh, through the plates, through the fiber optic cables into the instruments that actually record the spectra. All right, so let's talk about some results. So what has SDSS done? So let's start with the distant far away things back when the universe was much younger. And when I say much younger, I mean much younger, about 100,000 years old compared to the present day age of, near, of nearly 14 billion years old. So astronomers have known since the 1960s that there's this all sky microwave glow throughout the universe. And that dates back to about 100,000 years after the Big Bang. Uh, and we've known since the early 90s that it's not completely even. There are these patterns in this glow, the overlapping structures of different sizes that astronomers measure with plots like things in the lower left-hand corner. I'm not gonna go into the details, it's not important. The point is that these bumps tell us about how matter was distributed in the very, very, very early universe. And these little uh, distributions of matter, these little bumps and wiggles in, uh, in how mass was distributed got frozen in as the universe expanded and cooled. And in theory should be visible in the distribution of galaxies later in the universe that grew out of those little bumps of mass. And that's what's shown on the right-hand side. So the green blob there, this just shows the, the three-dimensional positions of galaxies in a wedge of the sky. Um, in order, and in order to measure whether or not these clumps of galaxies had the same patterns that we see in the cosmic microwave background, you need a lot, a lot, a lot of galaxies. And so this is one thing that SDSS was able to do so beautifully by having such an absolutely enormous data set. So the, we're not gonna go into detail. The bottom plot also has bumps and wiggles. There are different scales, so they're not supposed to be identical. Um, but the point is that we are able to see how the structure in the universe evolved over nearly 10 billion years of its history. And that tells us something about what dark matter, which is causing the expansion of the universe, how that's working uh, to expand the universe and preserve or not uh, the structures that we see that were baked in uh, in the very, very early stages. So that's one benefit from having an enormous data set. Uh, another one is looking at these very bright objects, things that aren't super faint or weak, but are super, super rare. So quasars here are supermassive black holes that live at the centers of galaxies. Uh, these black holes are millions or billions of times the mass of the sun. They're absorbing gas and dust and stars, spitting that energy back out uh, and shining really, really brightly, sometimes even outshining the entire rest of the galaxy. We know they can vary in brightness uh, and we thought that we understood how that happened, how those variations happened um, and how the, the uh, so uh, uh, on the bottom here, we see two more spectra. Uh, the top one shows what uh, the spectrum of what a black hole looks like when it's when it's being very bright, when it's absorbing a lot of material. Um, and we see that we have uh, that, that it's glowing in um, in energies that are associated with oxygen and glowing in energies that are associated with neon and things like this. Um, and this fit our theories of how black holes absorb material and spit energy back out. Uh, and we knew they could change over scales of years to decades. Um, with the very large sample size of SDSS and the many, many repeated observations of individual quasars, they actually found a handful of objects that varied a lot more than we thought we understood. They varied uh, um, a lot more quickly. So on the scales of months, even sometimes, they would completely lose these very, very big, bright emission lines of this particular color that kind of defines what a quasar is and leaves just the spectrum of the galaxy behind. Um, and we didn't think it was possible really before then for these kinds of changes to happen on such short time scales. So these new kinds of data are now changing our models of exactly how black holes eat material and spit the energy back out into the galaxy, um, which is really important for understanding how galaxies as a whole uh, evolved. So the big data sets are good if you want to find weak signals in big data, and they're good if you want to find rare things or things that don't live very long. Okay, so galaxies and quasars are used to study the universe on very large scales. I personally work on things that are a little bit closer to home. So the stars and the dust and the gas in our own Milky Way galaxy and the galaxies nearby. Um, my group is interested, we answer questions like when and where did the stars in the Milky Way form? How did they get their heavy elements? Uh, what kinds of mixing and structures and correlations are happening on scales that we just can't resolve in other galaxies? And then how do we use the fact that we can learn about those very fine grain details in our galaxy um, to help us interpret what we see in other systems. So the Milky Way is the only big spiral galaxy that we can actually take spectra and do detailed measurements of individual stars in. Uh, but for various reasons, it wasn't until relatively recently that we had the technology to do this for most stars 
uh, where most of the stars in the galaxy are. Uh, but now we do, and SDSS has a large program to study hundreds of thousands of stars that stretch across the Milky Way. And this is the project that I've been uh, most heavily involved in over the past several years. Uh, the picture being shown here is a map of uh, sort of the integrated or the, the, the summed up brightness in all of the stars across the whole galaxy. This is a 360 degree image, the center of the galaxy here. Um, and then if you look uh, here on the far left and right hand side, this is what this is, this is uh, what would be behind your head if you were looking at the center of the galaxy. So you can imagine this uh, wrapping around your entire head. These blobs down here are two of the uh, dwarf galaxies that are actually orbiting our Milky Way. If anyone has been to the southern, has been to the southern hemisphere and has been stargazing in the southern hemisphere, you may have seen these. They're easily visible to the naked eye once you get to a dark sky site, but those of us who live in the northern hemisphere don't see it, which is too bad. Okay, so one of the hottest areas of research right now is the origin of the elements in the periodic table. So hydrogen and helium were largely made in the Big Bang but pretty much everything else was made in stars from the massive explosions that end the lives of super heavy stars to the very slow, long, drawn out evolution of stars that are more like our sun. But the details of which stars make which elements at which point in the galaxy's history are actually pretty hard to pin down. And on top of that, these heavy elements are actually relatively rare in the universe. So hydrogen and helium together make up about 98% of all elemental matter which leaves only 2% for everything else. Um, but that 2%, of course, is where a lot of the interesting stuff happens and it affects how galaxies evolve all the way down to how humans uh, live our lives. And that's because the fraction of these heavy elements isn't the same everywhere. So it's much higher in planets and people and penguins and bacteria than it is in deep space. Um, and Carl Sagan famously said, we are made of star stuff. This is what he meant, that every atom in our bodies that isn't hydrogen or helium so every oxygen atom and every water molecule in your body was made in the star, not the sun, made in some other distant star that may not that, that isn't around anymore, uh, billions of years ago. Um, and so these details of where the different elements formed and how they get redistributed throughout the galaxy, this guides our understanding of things like where life is likeliest to form, what kinds of planets can form around different kinds of stars, um, and things like that. And one of the best tracers to, to study this kind of elemental mapping is the stars themselves. So I work on projects that uses the spectra of stars in the Milky Way to measure their heavy element ratios, which tells us about what the heavy elements were like that existed when the star formed in that particular part of the galaxy. So I showed a spectrum of a galaxy earlier. Um, a galaxy is millions or billions of stars altogether. The spectrum of a galaxy is the spectra of all of those stars added up together. But these lines here are actually spectra of individual single stars. So the colors that are drawn along each line show the features that are due to some of the most common elements in the human body. So wherever you see an orange line, that tells you that the shape of that wiggly line, the shape of that spectrum is dominated by the hydrogen in that star. Uh, wherever you see sort of a pale uh, blue or a cyan line, that tells you where the shape of that line is dominated by the oxygen in that star. And so by modeling, um, by modeling these spectra, we can tease out what kind of star it is, how fast it's moving and all that, but also how much of these heavy elements are in each of these stars. Um, the background picture here is, a, is an artist drawing of a, a galaxy that we think looks like the Milky Way, roughly the same size. And the blue points show the locations of the stars in this galaxy that we can measure these heavy element abundances in. And so we're able to map out, say, the ratio of oxygen to carbon over a pretty decent fraction um, of the galaxy, which is, which is really cool. And, yeah, which is, which is super awesome. Um, and so by mapping out where we see the elements, uh, how much variation we have in different elements in different parts of the galaxy, what else is happening nearby, this is how we put together a picture of the different processes that produce each element. And one nice way to show that is just by coloring in the periodic table, so highlighting different elements that are made in different ways. So some elements like, say, sodium, magnesium, oxygen, uh, are predominantly made in the explosions of massive stars at the ends of their lives, while carbon and nitrogen, say, also very important for life, uh, tend to come more from low mass stars like the sun in their final several hundred thousand years of life. Um, so mapping out the distribution and ratio of these elements also tells us about the relative frequency of, the, of, uh, of these different production mechanisms at different times in the galaxy's history. And that's really important for tracing out the galaxy's evolution as a whole. OK, 
okay, the other piece of this puzzle is figuring out when the stars that we're seeing formed. Uh, age dating stars is really hard. Age dating humans, by comparison, is a lot easier. I think that probably most of us, if you just looked at someone, you could probably guess their age, give or take five or 10 years, maybe. Um, and the reason we can do this is because most humans age in very similar ways. We go through similar changes and at the same rate. And this is 100% not true for stars. Uh, the stages that a star goes through and how long it spends in each stage depends entirely on how massive it was when it formed. And that's a property that we don't know for very many stars at all. It's safest to assume that we just don't know it. Um, so for example here, at the, so this, this top row here are very, very heavy stars, things that are 10, 20, 50 times the mass of the sun. These things only live for a few million years and they don't do, which doesn't give them a whole lot of time to do a whole lot. So they're very big, they're very hot, they're very, very bright, and then they explode. And they leave behind perhaps a black hole, perhaps some other core of super, super, super dense material, but they return a lot of their, uh, a lot of their material in this explosion out back into the gas around them. On the other hand, stars that are very light, so things that are less than the mass of the sun, so down here at the bottom, just kind of sit there, faintly glowing, with a life expectancy that is many times the current age of the universe. Um, every star that has ever been born that has a mass less than about 85% the mass of the sun is still around. Um, it has a lifespan older than the, um, the current age of the universe and stars that are less massive than that can live for hundreds of billions of years. Stars around the mass of the sun tend to live for about 10 billion years, but they'll tend to look like the sun for those 10 billion years. And so it's really hard to tell where in that 10 billion year window a given star is. But it turns out, luckily, that if you have data for a huge number of stars where you do have some mass information and this data is taken with the same instruments and is all very carefully dealt with, I'm not gonna go into the details of how that's done, but again, big data comes to the rescue. You're actually able to tease out very, very, very subtle age information um, from the from the stellar data. And so you can actually begin to then estimate ages for individual stars, which is super, super, super exciting. So we can begin making age maps of the stars in the galaxy. So this background here, this is a computer simulation of the Milky Way uh, overlaid with the positions of stars that we've observed colored by their age. So red are the oldest stars and blue are the youngest stars. And by young here, I'm still, I'm still talking about a few billion years old, but young compared to the age of the universe. Now, different models of how galaxies form and evolve make different predictions about where the oldest and youngest stars should be based on how they predict the galaxy to grow. And so here we can clearly see that the oldest stars are in the center of the galaxy and the youngest stars are further out in the disk. And so this rules out any galaxy formation theory that doesn't start with a young Milky Way being very small, eight to 10 billion years ago, and then getting bigger and bigger and bigger as the disk forms stars further and further and further out. Uh, we call this inside out, galaxy formation, and you need these big data sets in order to be able to see that. And data keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So the current generation of SDSS, which is SDSS 4, will phase out over the rest of this year. Um, it was supposed to have ended earlier this year, but pandemic. Um, and so, but we're going to keep the whole project going with SDSS 5, which is going to continue a lot of the um, the legacy and the infrastructure is going to rely on a lot of the legacy and infrastructure from earlier SDSS, but is going to expand it immensely. So we're going to have the same two dedicated facilities, adding a couple extra telescopes at both facilities in New Mexico and in Chile, so we can continue to, to, to scan the entire sky. We're going to add spectra of hundreds of, hundreds of thousands of supermassive black holes and galaxy clusters, uh, including in, um, among those black holes are including several of those really bizarre changing look quasars that I mentioned earlier, these black holes that seem to turn off too quickly. Um, and it's really challenging our understanding of the physics of black hole accretion. We're gonna map where stars are forming in the Milky Way and in some nearby galaxies uh, using how newborn stars light up the gas around them. Uh, I showed the video earlier of the solar systems forming and the brown dwarfs being created and flung around. And so this project is gonna be looking at that happening in the real universe uh, pretty close by. And the project that I'm most excited about is taking spectra of 5 million stars across the entire galaxy. So the same kind of very high quality data that lets us measure heavy elements and star ages. Um, and the sample will be more than 10 times the number of stars that we have now. And as for why that increase matters. So I mentioned earlier that we have to select, for instance, when we're taking spectra of galaxies, we have to select just a small number of galaxies to take spectra of 
from the big images that have you know, 200 million galaxies in them. We have to do the same thing with stars in the Milky Way. So here's a shamelessly beautiful plug for Utah again. Uh, this is the Milky Way over um, where the National Monument is down in Southern Utah. And here are the positions of some of the stars that my project has, has observed. So the, the big gray circles are the footprints of those plates that I was showing earlier. And the little white dots inside each circle are the stars themselves. Now, there are thousands of stars in these circles that we haven't measured that aren't covered by a white dot, not to mention all of the stars that are between the big circles and then out beyond where the circles are, um, are looking. And this isn't all the circles that, that our project has observed, but this gives you a sense of sort of what the density of that, um, of that uh, of those observations are. So why does it matter that we're not getting every star? Well, let's say that there are two competing models of the Milky Way, two different ways in which the magnesium could be distributed in the galaxy. So here I'm gonna use two uh, American paintings to stand in for these models. Now, if we sample these paintings or sample these models, look at, study these models at the density that we're currently limited to, these are the patterns that we see. Uh, now, normally when I'm giving this talk in person, we do a little bit of polling with the audience to get a sense of if, if anyone can identify which, which paintings they are. So take a second and ruminate on that. Um, okay, got your guess. Okay, so on the left we have uh, Mark Rothko's Orange and Yellow and on the right is Untitled by uh, Jean-Michel Basquiat. So if we go to the density of observations that SDSS-5 will have, and this is the density that we're sampling these paintings at now, we get much, much closer to the fuller picture of what's happening. So the coarser sampling that we see here is enough to distinguish between these two models. We can tell that they're different. Um, and maybe if the Milky Way were like the Rothko on the left, it would be enough to, over, to, 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 uh, to describe the overall behavior. If I flip back again, you see that the patterns that you can tell from the low density sampling are pretty similar to the patterns that you see with the full density sampling. But everything that we learn about the Milky Way points to it being more like the Basquiat. There's complicated structures on all scales and patterns that we just can't see when we're only looking at a very small fraction of the stars. So that's why I argue that we need to keep pushing the envelope, taking advantage of the new technology that we have to explore the 20 questions that pop up every time we answer one. Um, we, and by we, I mean astronomers and scientists are solving mysteries now that couldn't even have been formulated as questions 100 years ago. And I expect the same will be true in another 100 years. Um, but, by, but by building up these very massive data sets that ensures that when we can ask those questions, we've got some of the tools already in hand uh, to start finding the answers. So uh, with that, I will wrap up and say thank you. Well, thank you, Gail. Um, people who have questions, please submit them on the Q&A line and I'll pitch them to Gail as we can. Uh, Gail, a question came in very early when you showed your, your videos and it asked if you could provide any background on how those simulations were made. Yeah, was there one in particular no, that- very general question. Okay, yeah. So the simulations are run on, um, on very large computer systems, um, many, 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 many cores. I guess let's start with this one because this one I think is my favorite. I'll just play it again because it's pretty. Um, yeah, so this is all run. So you have, I mean, I'll, I'm not sure what level the, the, the question asker is asking from, so I'll go back. So basically, you have a bunch of equations that describe how things change over time. So you've got uh, this particular thing will have, for a given place in the galaxy, it's got what is the gravity uh, field like at this particular place? What is the material at this particular point made out of? What is uh, what are the stars doing nearby? What are what is the gas doing nearby? Are the stars going to be exploding? Are the stars not exploding? Um, and so, for every single time step, you say, "Okay, what's everything doing right now? How is it being impacted by the gas and stars and things that are nearby?" And then let's change it up to one more time step. How has how have the stars and the gas and how have the heavy elements and how has the temperature changed since the previous step? How does that change what's going to happen next? And so it's all done by, by plugging a uh, very, very sophisticated series of equations into very powerful super, uh, supercomputers and letting them run for anywhere from hours to weeks to months. Um, and in the end, you get out a very large data file that has for different positions in the universe, say, uh, what was the, how much matter did you have at a given point? What was its temperature, its density, and so on uh, as a function of time. And then we use that to try to understand how, how these very, very complex physical systems evolve over time. Because the other thing to keep in mind with the simulations, one thing that they're super useful is not only do they show us the, the very complex relationships between 
the different forces, but also they show us the time evolution of systems that we're never going to actually observe uh, evolve during our reasonable lifetime. I mean, these are, these are changes that take place over billions of years, and we're never going to be able to actually watch that happen in real life. So, um, yeah, that's what. Okay, thank you. Another question, since it is difficult to age date stars, how do astronomers know how old the sun is and when it will collapse? That's a really good question. Um, so there's a number of lines of evidence for the age of the sun. One thing that makes it a little bit unique, actually, let me go down to the age slide. Uh, so the sun is the only star, the solar system, I guess, is the only solar system that we actually have material that we can age date. So. 99.9% .9 of everything we know about the universe comes from light, more recently from gravity waves. Uh, a very, very tiny fraction of our knowledge comes from actual physical stuff. And one of these things is uh, uh, material dust grains left over from the formation of the very early solar system. And so we've actually been able to capture some of these particles. Um, my spacecraft flying out through the solar system can actually collect some of these grains that date back to the earliest solar system, uh, that date back to the formation of the solar system. And we can use uh, radio dating, um, radioactive dating to date those back to about four and a half billion years, which puts a limit. The sun has to be at least that old, otherwise there wouldn't be a solar system around it. Um, but the sun is also, but as far as, so I, I mentioned that there are these very, very, very subtle signatures and stars that tell us uh, clues about their life. And that's one of the, and again, the sun is one of the few places where we can actually measure that not easily, but much more easily for the sun than for other stars. And that's just because it's so very bright. So collecting super high resolution, super detailed data. We have very sophisticated models of what the interior of the star looks like. And that does change uh, more than the surface changes over the course of the star's lifetime. So, we're, so what, once we're able to model how the interior of the star has changed a little bit, that gives us also a, um, a handle on, on how old the sun is, um, which is much older than earlier estimates for the sun which was like hundreds of thousands of years. Here's another question. Are you reaching any limitations in computer processing power as you are collecting more and more data? Yes, for sure. Um, very, very, very large data sets. Once, you know, just trying to build a framework to, to store everything. Uh, I mean, we have some of the, especially some of the bigger projects that are going to be coming online over the next decade. Um, doing imaging and doing spectroscopy. And we're talking billions, tens of billions of objects. And so storing all of that information, um, running it through your code, how, how do you process this much information in a reasonable time frame? So there's been, um, I mean, we've been uh, astronomers and there's some, many astronomers that sort of specialize in, in how to adapt most cutting edge computer technology to solving these data problems. There's also been a lot of partnerships with uh, corporations like Google, uh, and Amazon to, to use their computing services developed for, for corporate reasons, but then also to adapt those to, um, to be used for science. Actually, the SDSS partnered with uh, Microsoft very early on back in the 90s, which was one of the reasons why it was able to process and then serve its data publicly uh, to the community, um, which was an early example of, of which was another example of how sort of trends that there are, um, are being continued today, but um, yeah. It is a problem. Okay, here's a related question. How much data is there and how do you sort through it to find interesting data? Oh, that is a good question. Um, so in terms of, I don't actually know the numbers off the top of my head. If you, I can, I can put a, I, I can put the, um, the website to the, to the data. I guess one thing I'll just emphasize again is every single Photon, every single bit of data that has been collected by SS, SDSS is publicly available. And I can, I'll can i put the website in the, um, in the chat for that. Um, and on there, it has the numbers for exactly how many terabytes, I think petabytes at this point of data are available. Um, in terms of numbers, like I said early, the, um, as far as the imaging surveys go, we're looking at uh, hundreds of thousands, hundreds of millions of, of total objects. The data set that I work with has about 500,000 stars. Again, it'll be going up to about 5 million stars. And, uh, and yeah, and how, how do you find the interesting things? This is, this is the tricky bit. And so people who think about astro statistics and thinking about outlier detection and thinking about pattern recognition are working really hard to, how do you decide when something looks abnormal because it's interesting and how, and when does something look abnormal because it's wrong or it's an artifact in the data or something went wrong in the processing? Um, 
And actually the non-astronomers, the citizen scientists have been very, very helpful for this. So I don't know if people are familiar with the, the Galaxy Zoo project and that family of, family of projects, but there's, because it's very hard for a computer to identify when something is abnormal because it's interesting and abnormal because it's, it's, it's wrong, humans are much, much better at this. So actually there's been a lot of interesting work in taking uh, and harnessing the power of citizen scientists to sort of manually classify this is this kind of object, this is this kind of interesting object, this is this kind of weird artifact that shouldn't be in the data set, and then building these really sophisticated machine learning tools based on those classifications and applying it to the 200 million objects that definitely no one is ever going to look at themselves by eye um, and trying to identify the things that look abnormal because they're interesting out of that data set. Another question, you mentioned that black holes spit out energy. What happens to that energy? How does it affect the area around it? Yeah, it's a bit flippant, but yes, that's a good question. So um, actually, yeah, so the question, so in the, in, in the lower left-hand panel here, so this is an artist's conception of the accretion disk around, uh, around a supermassive black hole. So we actually don't really know how the spitting out happens. Um, the bright white thing you see at the top is a jet, is our artist's conception of a jet of, of, uh, of material, a very hot material being launched um, away, from the, uh, away from the supermassive black hole. We think that a lot of the light and the energy that we see from the black hole is coming from, uh, from the very hot gas disk that's around the black hole that's falling in. As it falls in, it gets compressed, it gets heated up, and it glows brightly, like, like glows in X-ray thermal, like very, very, very hot. And then it also launches these jets sometimes um, that are also made of hot material that glow. And then some of the energy goes into the kinetic energy of the jets themselves. Um, and so all that energy can, can get deposited into the galaxy that surrounds it. Um, we think that one of the reasons that galaxies may stop forming stars at certain points in their life is because, that star because the star formation processes actually get shut off when you inject too much energy into the system. And so it's really hard to match sort of the patterns that we observe in galaxy ages and galaxy uh, stellar patterns if you don't include these supermassive black hole energy, uh, in, um, this, this, this supermassive black hole is injecting energy into the galaxies. So they, um, they yeah, it's sort of, yeah, I guess I'll... Where is the best place in the US to view stars? Um, Depends what you mean by best. So some of the darkest, the darkest skies in the U.S. are out here in the West. Um, there's some really nice uh, Google overlay, uh, Google map overlays that you can find if you just look for Google map dark sky or something. You'll find people have made these really nice overlays that show what the average light pollution is. Um, and there's definitely regions in Montana and in Colorado and in Utah and Wyoming um, and down into uh, and, and Nevada, of course, uh, where it's just it's dark. It's so 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 very dark. Um, of course, you're also a long, way from, a long way from civilization. So if best to you includes being able to get to a warm place afterwards um, and a you know, mug of hot chocolate afterwards, then you probably don't want to go hundreds of miles into the middle of the desert. But um, those are some of the darkest, the darkest skies in the US at least. Um, yeah. I, I, I had never really seen the, the Milky Way in all of its glory until I moved out to Utah. Um, and it's, it's pretty spectacular. Okay, we've expended our queue. Do we have any other questions? Okay, well, I wanna thank you, Gail, for coming and spending this time with us. And if we could all send some warm telepathic message again um, for the time that Gail took with us tonight. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you for having me. Thanks everyone for coming out on a Friday. <laughs>